Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Calico networking with BPF. Um, so the, the Calico team have added a new data plane to Calico that uses eBPF. So I'm going to uh, unpack that and, and see why we did it and what it's all about. Um, so yeah, why, why add another data plane to Calico? So um, we designed Calico from the ground up. Um, I'm kind of assuming everyone knows what Calico is, but it's it's one of the uh, uh, leading like CNI networking plugins and and uh, network policy engines uh, for Kubernetes. Um, we designed it from the ground up with a with a pluggable data plane architecture. So we have a general philosophy of trying to use the best tool for the job in each environment. So on Linux, we started with our standard Linux data plane. So that uses IP tables, IP routing. Um, we started there because it's it's tried and trusted. It's uh, compatible with a wide wide range of distros and kernels. Um, it's also scalable. Um, so the the routing uh, architecture on Linux is very scalable, and we were able to scale uh, IP tables to to um, uh, implement uh, our rich policy. Um, that's where we started. It was it was a natural place at the time when when we built Calico. Later on, um, we added Windows support to Calico, which is part of our commercial offering. Um, and obviously, the selling point there is it supports Windows, but it has a very different underlying architecture, um, and and the policy framework on Windows is very different. Um, but we took the same uh, data model and and we render it. Uh, into the Windows data plane instead. Um, and now what I'm talking about today is our, our new data plane. So um, the technologies in the kernel, like I said, we want to use the best tool for the job. The technologies in the kernel are evolving over time. Um, so we want to keep up with that. Um, eBPF is, is starting to mature and become very interesting. Um, the, the big selling point of eBPF is it lets us put kind of fast paths in into the kernel so we can say if the packet looks just like this then fast path it and don't send it through all the normal processing and just do exactly what we want to do with it um, and it's all about future proofing Calico so we're keeping the uh, the standard Linux data plane and that's going to be right for anyone who's on older kernels or anyone who's conservative and not wanting to use the, the cutting edge stuff, but we also want to future proof Calico. So as the, as the uh, new technology comes along and matures, we're, we're using, still using the right tool for the job. Um, yeah, so what is this new eBPF thing um, that we're using? Um, well, it's the extended Berkeley packet filter which tells you very little. <laughs> um, so uh, it's an in-kernel virtual machine that allows you to load small programs into the kernel um, that, that do things. And we say this gives, uh, gives superpowers to Linux because they can, they can do really special things like unusual things that the particular area of the Linux kernel wouldn't naturally do. Um, so, the, the, the name and, and where that comes from, um, it was originally a, a way of defining filters um, for what packets you wanted uh, to, to export up to user space when you're using a tool like TCP dump. So if you use TCP dump, you type TCP dump and then it displays all the packets that are flowing through your system um, one by one as, as they arrive on a particular interface. Um, and there can be a lot of packets, and if you only want to look at some of them, then you can write a filter that says, you know, only show me IP packets or only show me packets to this IP address. Um, and under the covers, TCP dump uses a, a Berkeley packet filter to make that happen. It's where the name comes from. But it's been wildly extended inside the kernel, so the, the name doesn't really fit, but that's where it comes from. Um, and it's now a sort of generic mechanism for attaching little programs uh, to particular hooks in the kernel. Um, and I call them hooks because uh, 
it, it's always event driven. So uh, something inside the kernel happens and then it runs your BPF program. So they don't run, they don't have their own kind of process. They don't run on their own. Um, you can't have sort of loops. They're always activated by something happening. Um, the programs are verified to make sure that they're safe. Um, so this isn't a generic kind of kernel module system, like the kernel already has one of those. Um, it's a way you can attach programs that can do very like specific defined things inside the kernel. And they're not allowed to do things like crash, which is great. Um, they're not allowed to access arbitrary memory and they're only allowed to interact with the wider kernel through helper functions. Um, so helper functions um, uh, like let you do kind of interesting things, but they're they're limited. So each hook only has a specific set of helper functions that it's allowed to use. So maybe a networking hook would be allowed to redirect the packet. But if you didn't have that hook, if you didn't have that helper function to redirect the packet, then you wouldn't be able to implement packet redirection as a thing because you'd be too limited in BPF um, in and of itself. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of a limit to the superpowers, but that's being expanded all the time as the, the kernel community adds more hooks and more helpers. Um, the easiest way to write one of these these days is to write C code in a, in a limited uh, dialect, and then uh, you can use a, um, the compiler called Clang to compile that to BPF code. So it's, it's fairly civilized to, to write these programs these days. Um, what can you do with uh, with a, a BPF program? So talked about there being loads of hooks. Um, it, it has very broad applicability. So one thing you can do is security. Um, so um, there's a, a hook called setcomp where you can attach a BPF program, and that allows you to police the um, uh, system calls that particular user space programs are making. Um, so you could use that to lock down a particular program and say you're allowed to access this file because I've checked the name of the file when you make the open syscall and you're not allowed to access this file or you know any like loads of different options there. Um, logging and tracing is a big use case. Um, so you can uh, hook almost any function in the kernel for logging and tracing. Um, but the helpers that you have there are very limited. So you can record a statistic and like add to a counter, or you can write a log to a pipe that you can read from, from user space. Um, but you can't like interfere with the data that a particular function in the kernel is processing. So you can, you have very broad, a very broad suite of hooks, but very narrow helper functions. Um, and then there's network routing and packet filtering, which is really the ones that, that um, Calico is using for this. So there's a range of different hooks there, um, range of different capabilities. So what helpers they have, a range of places where they interact with the networking stack. So um, there's the XPP hook, which is super, super early. There's the um, traffic control hooks, which are a little bit later. There's some hooks in the routing table itself. And there's some various other like um, hooks around, uh, around the kernel. And each of them has different capabilities for what it can do with the packets or the sockets or whatever its native kind of um, uh, like context is. Um, and those are the ones that we're, we're making use of and, and the ones that will be where we're kind of exploring for, for Calico. Um, so we decided to add um, a new data plane. We decided it was the right time to sort of explore and, and try to figure out what Calico's sort of V2 data plane was going to be. Um, how did we decide what we wanted to build? Um, so we did a lot of investigation and, and prototyping, um, first of all. Um, we, wanted, uh, we wanted the new data plane to be kind of genuinely better than the old, so genuine performance wins. Um, you know, at least if you're the right sort of user who who's uh, on a new kernel and and um, all the kind of uh, all the right like intersections in the Venn diagram, and you're the right right group of users that we're targeting. Um, we wanted it to be genuinely um, like higher performance, higher scale, that that kind of thing. 
Um, so we evaluated various different technology um, combinations, um, like going, going broader than BPF, but BPF was on our list um, from the start. Um, we looked at IPV LAN because um, there there'd been a bit of excitement around that as an alternative to what Calico normally uses for um, networking uh, pods, which was a, a VETH device. Um, at the time when we tested it, it was really slow and we were really surprised. Um, and it turned out to be a kernel bug that was only very recently fixed. So uh, we ruled that one out, but maybe we'll take another look at it later. Um, we looked at NF tables, which is the sort of next generation of IP tables, um, which is the sort of standard Linux networking way of doing um, uh, packet filtering and policy. Um, so unfortunately we found that NF tables was generally slower than IP tables. And I think this has been known for, for quite a while. Um, the, the reason that the kernel community wanted to replace IP tables with NF tables um, was for various kind of API reasons. Like it has a much cleaner API to build on in future, um, but they know that it's not up to the same performance level as IP tables yet. So it does have a cleaner API, but worse performance for our users. So we, we, have, we haven't gone down that path yet. Um, although Calico's standard data plane is compatible with IP tables and NF tables compatibility mode. Um, so you can, can use this on an NF table system. Um, we looked at various socket based approaches. Um, so getting like more involved, like earlier on in the processing. So before, before you even see packets on the wire, um, could we grab hold of the socket and, and do something clever with it? Um, there's um, various sort of bits of prior art there where people have done fun things. Um, so we found like, yeah, there's, there's some things that you can do, but um, it's hard to cover all the cases, particularly when we have such a broad feature set in Calico. So we've, we've smattered a little bit of that sort of stuff into, into the new data plane, um, but, it, but it's hard to make a full full data plane out of it, particularly when some of the things we do are really defined on, on the packet level. Um, we looked at XDP, which is the sort of earliest BPF hook in the pipeline. Um, it's very fast, uh, but it has so a limited set of helper functions that you can use, and it only supports ingress uh, traffic. So um, for Calico, which supports ingress and egress policy, there were a lot of challenges to using that. Um, uh, for, for everything anyway. Um, we've ended up with um, TCBPF being the best balance. So it has a very rich set of helper functions in the hooks. We can implement most of, uh, most of what we need to implement there. Um, and we've included a few sort of socket based enhancements as well. So we do connect time load balancing um, when we're doing uh, NAT operations in, in the new data plane. Um, and we're using Clang to compile the BPF programs ahead of time. Uh, and then uh, we have Felix, our po per host agent, agent um, generating the, the um, individual policy for each pod or each uh, workload like on each, each individual host. So we have ahead of time compiled programs and then we generate some bytecode nice and snappily using sort of uh, assembler like right there on the, on the host. Um, talk a little bit more about the fun we had with, um, with XDP. Um, so that was, that's the uh, express data path BPF hook. Um, so it's awesome on paper. Um, so you can run BPF programs all the way down in the NIC, which is fantastic. Um, but you can only do that if your NIC is compatible and there's only a small number of NICs that are compatible. Um, and if you're, if you're running something like Cloudflare and you have control of the hardware and you're, you can put those um, programs all the way down the NIC, it's awesome. You can, you can handle millions of packets per second with an XDP program and um, uh, do all kinds of interesting things like uh, load balancing and, and dropping huge DOS floods and, and things like that. Um, but we were trying to use it to, to see if we could build a, a data plane for Calico. And one of the things we need to do there is to redirect packets that you know they come in on your ETH zero and we want to send them to a pod. So we tried we tried a prototype with XDP and found uh, yeah it was it was slower if we uh, 
did that redirect to XPP. Um, it turns out there's various issues with the, with using XTP all within one host like that. So uh, one of them is um, the kernel had a workaround where it had to do an, an extra nappy poll, which is a sort of internal kernel mechanism when it goes on that packet path. And so that slowed everything down when we were using it for, for pod networking. Um, so I think XTP will probably make an appearance in our data plane later um, for handling various cases. Um, and as I say, we already use it for denial of service protection. Um, but as a general approach, like it's really hard to, to, um, uh, to productize and to, to get it, uh, uh, get it to all work together. Um, like a particular headache is you, if you have two network interfaces and they, one of them supports XDP offload and the other one doesn't, you can't use offload on that one because then you can't send packets to the other one and everything falls apart. So that was, that was the reason that we didn't use uh, XDP. Um, yeah, still great for DOS protection and that's what we use it for in, in the Calico standard data plane. Um, yeah, so how, how does this all compare to the existing data plane? Um, don't worry, there's some graphs coming up. Um, so we're aiming for the same user experience here. Um, so once you've turned it on, well, you should still have the same rich uh, policy language. So Calico has uh, supports the Kubernetes network policy um, resources, also has our additional Calico network policy um, type, which is richer than the um, Kubernetes one. Um, uh, we, we use the same routed approach for packets. So uh, we, we use L3 routing because that scales really well. That's what the internet's based on. Um, and in general, we try to keep everything we can the same um, as the old data plane, except where we've identified like a bypass. Um, so we'll route the packet unless the BPF program decides, oh no, I've got a faster way of getting this packet through and it will send it on the fast path. Otherwise we'll fall, fall back to the normal kernel processing and the kernel will route the packet. Um, that was certainly a recommendation of the Linux kernel developers who work on BPF, that you try to think of BPF as a, a way to implement fast paths rather than a way to like totally replace everything. Um, aim for the same great scalability. So like, you know, high numbers of nodes, loads of pods, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, we haven't implemented everything yet. So we've implemented support for workload policy. We haven't implemented um, host protection policy or micro segmentation. You might be familiar with it as, um, but that's, that's on the cards uh, as we move towards GA. And as I say, we designed the designed the data plane with that in mind and that pushed us in particular directions. Um, eBPF, like, like say, the, the main idea is to have fast paths. Um, so one consequence of that is if the fast, if a particular packet takes the fast path, then we bypass some of the Linux networking stack. Um, so that means if you have your own IP tables rules that you're relying on, then a packet that takes the fast path may bypass those. So that's something to be aware of if you want, if you want the most compatible data plane that works with your own rules and everything, then IP tables one is where you want to be. Um, if you want to try this out and you're willing to accept that, that you can't use IP tables for packets that, that we're handling, then, then that's, uh, uh, might be right for you. Um, so one big change is we're handling Kubernetes services natively. Um, so there's no cube proxy when you're using um, uh, when you're using the Calico BPF data plane. Uh, so the the reason for that is um, once we factored in all the features that Calico needs to support, so micro segmentation, um, then we found that we couldn't really interwork with the um, IP tables cube proxy, um, or not without jumping through a lot of hoops. So uh, we took the difficult decision to to import the business logic from Cube Proxy, so we're we're trying to use as much as we can, but then to implement the um, the actual NAT behavior and, and load balancing that Cube Proxy does within uh, within Calico, um, and 
like we've been able to um, improve on some of the things that Cube Proxy does as well. Um, so yeah, we need a really new kernel for this. We're using um, some features like encapsulation, where you need a very new kernel for the, the right helper functions to be available. Um, we're exploring whether we can support slightly older kernels, but we've also got the standard Linux data plane as well. So you know, if you want, if you want the cutting edge stuff, new kernel, new data plane. If you want the compatibility, older kernel, and the uh, the older data plane. Right onto the graphs. Um, so this graph shows what happens if you put the new data plane on. Um, a pair of servers with a back-to-back -back 40 gigabit link, so a nice high capacity link. And then we ran um, a, a Kubernetes setup with pods um, and we ran kubeperf between the two. So that's a quite a simple um, TCP throughput uh, benchmark. Um, it's single threaded, so it doesn't use, the, use everything to the max because um, uh, it is just a basic benchmark. But just in that simple case, you can see that um, the throughput on the new data plane, which is the, the red bars, is, is quite a bit higher, especially at smaller packet sizes. And that's because we've reduced the CPU usage per packet when we're using the eBPF data plane uh, quite substantially. So you see quite a big difference when, you, when you're using small packets. Um, you need to be up at you know, tens, of, tens of gigabits to really feel it. But even at the lower, um, at the lower end, we're still using less CPU. So you'll save a bit of CPU on your, your networking, uh, networking stack. Um, this is one of, uh, so native handling of services. So handling Kube proxy services uh, within Calico. Um, so the, the IP tables Kube proxy uses a very long list of rules in IP tables to implement um, services. So the more services you have, the more rules it has. And that means that the first packet or the, the TCP handshake um, for a new connection pays a, pays a bigger price the more services you have. So this graph shows um, as you scale up the number of services from zero to 10,000, um, IP tables mode cube proxy adds about a millisecond of latency for a thousand services, uh, 10,000 services, sorry. So if you have 20,000, that'd be two milliseconds. Um, and, and so on, just, just linearly going up. Um, the uh, BPF data plane, because it uses a very efficient map lookup um, in, in the same way as IPVS, we're able to um, remove a lot of that latency and, and keep it flat all the way out to, to 10,000 and beyond. Um, so you'll see lower latency, but it is only for that first packet. So the subsequent packets are all connection tracked in all the different data planes. And so they, they have an efficient path. Um, but yeah, so in, in this graph, we perform slightly better than IPVS cube proxy, but it's really splitting hairs down at the bottom, like, you know, fractions of a millisecond. Um, we also found that our data plane uses a lot less CPU when we're doing updates. So this has been a pain point with cube proxy. Um, so when you're, uh, when you're churning services, um, cube proxy um, in IP tables mode has to, um, uh, has to load the whole IP table state up and modify it and, and send it back down again, which is quite expensive. And IPVS mode seems to do something similar to that as well. So this in, in this graph shows the CPU usage where in the middle of the chart, um, we churned a, a service over and over for a, for a few minutes. Um, and that generated quite a lot of load in, in, um, in Cube Proxy, but in our data plane, it's a very modest uh, bump to the amount of CPU used on the system. Um, we measured the total CPU across the whole system with um, with the with Cube Proxy running in uh, uh, in the Cube Proxy tests, and then with Calico running in in the other one. So this is a whole whole C whole system CPU, uh, including whatever CPU IP tables and the kernel is using and everything. Um, so quite a bit better there. I was kind of surprised to see IPVS kind of not, I, I thought the IPVS cube proxy would have been down where we were, but, but it did seem to use more. So that's what we're showing. Um, another thing we've been able to do um, is um, particularly important for um, like 
people who want to combine Kubernetes services and policy. So uh, I don't know if anyone's tried to um, combine policy with like a node port or something like that. You run into this problem where a packet comes in from an external client and it comes in on one host and kube proxy uh, does an SNAT of the packet in order to send it to a, another host. So it changes the source IP and whatever your, um, whatever your pod that's receiving that request um, uh, gets, it, it sees the, um, it, it doesn't see the external host, the external client's IP. It sees the kind of ingress nodes IP, which um, is really bad for your um, kind of HTTP logs in Nginx or whatever you're using. Um, but it's even worse if you're trying to do um, like policy because what does everyone want to do? They want to say, allow traffic from this particular external IP, but they get confused because the packet comes in and they're not seeing that IP and the policy sees the wrong IP as well. So what we've done in our, um, uh, in our data plane is rather than using SNAP to get packets to the right host, we're actually encapsulating them with a, um, with a, a tunnel at the XLAN tunnel and sending them to the right host, which means they arrive with the right source IP. So your, um, your pod sees the right source IP, policy sees the, the external IP as well. So your rules to say like allow from some external IP, they just work uh, very naturally. Um, and then once we've done that, we're, with the sort of superpowers of BPF, we're able to do direct return where we kind of skip the hop back to the original host and we send the packet straight back to the to where it came from. Um, so that takes out another another network hop. Um, and this graph shows the uh, the improvement in in uh, connect time latency and and kind of single request response latency by removing that extra hop on on our test bed again on the the same forty gig uh, test bed that we had before. So it shaves off about half a millisecond on on the sort of round trip time versus um, versus cube proxy with SNAT and going all the way back to the original host. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of um, the differences. Uh, if you want to try this out, um, there's a, a link on screen there, and and we'll we'll share these slides. Um, I'd say one thing I want to emphasize is current release is a tech preview release. There are known issues and known like security issues uh, in the in the product, like pieces we haven't implemented yet that we know we need to. We wanted to implement a broad selection of, of features in this first release so that we knew we had a sort of um, a good design that could hit all the bases, but there are a few things that we need to do before we can call this GA. Um, that link there links to a sort of how-to guide that will will guide you through um, uh, trying this out. Um, what's next? Um, so we're uh, fixing the gaps we know about, um, dealing with um, like, like one of the issues at the moment is it has a fixed MTU size. Um, we don't support IPv6 yet, um, but we're working on those things and, and those will be coming in, a, in a, an upcoming release. Um, we also haven't incorporated this into Calico Enterprise yet. Um, so that that will be coming too. Cool. Um, that's the end of my talk. Um, were there any uh, questions or? Um... There are some questions, but before that, Sean. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Um, okay, there's actually quite a lot of questions. All right, let's get into those uh, now. So first up. Um, can we combine IP tables host protection policy with eBPF for pod networking in a single deployment? What's happening? Okay. Oh, uh, so not not at the moment. Um, so uh, when you switch over to, to BPF mode, um, the IP tables uh, stuff is is disabled at the moment. Um, but yeah, adding host protection is is on our list. There's just a few things we need to uh, to do before that. Got it. Uh, John asks, what is the difference between Calico and Cilium eBPF data planes? Um, well, they both use BPF, but I, I don't know much about the internals of their approach. Um, and uh, obviously, like, don't want to know too much about a competitor's uh, kind of 
approach they want to. Um, Okay, fair enough. And then Joshua Roppo asks, says, thanks for the talk. Could you give some examples of why XDP was too limiting? Um, so I think I think I went over those in, in the talk. Um, the, um, the, the sort of main thing is um, it only supports ingress. So you have to, you have to pair it with something else to support egress as well. Um, and um, another thing was we were very keen on getting this um, this redirect bypass to work, and what we found was when we used the XDP version of that, um, it actually made things slower when we benchmarked it, and that's because of this um, this workaround that was in the kernel. Um, I don't know if they've removed that because it's a re it's a really fast moving um, part of the kernel. Um, but basically to get the function to work, they'd had to make a workaround, which then slowed things down on the particular path that we needed to use. Um, the other thing that was really difficult about it was productizing it. So one of the things that we, we need is we need to make our data plane work on a wide range of hardware. So we need to cover, you know, the public clouds, we need to cover on-prem, we need to cover um, like a whole range of things. Um, an XDP uh, has like multiple different modes and different offload capabilities depending on what hardware you're running on, uh, and that that makes it very difficult to productize. 